What's up, City Light? Morning. Ooh, we got a couple claps. A couple people got filled with the spirit during worship. I like it. Hey, y'all, I'm Roy, one of the pastors here at City Light Bennington. We're, we are a church that multiplies Jesus-centered, spirit-led disciples and Lord willing one day churches, right? You with me? Any core team members still caught up in the vision? <laughs> Praise God. We haven't forgotten and it's only been a year. Hey, um, there are times in a sermon when I prepare and I'm like, the, the illustrations come natural to your boy. It's a grabbing one, it woos you in, there's a story. And then there are certain times when the text just preaches like fire and brimstone. And the word of God, just by even reading it together, ends up breaking the hard hearts, of uh, hard places of people's hearts. And it cuts and it divides. And so this is going to be one of them Bible study type Sundays. Anyone in for one of them? Just let the word of God preach and we get straight into it. Is that okay? Okay, great. So we have two gentlemen back there, Steve and John. They're going to be walking down the aisle and they're going to, you're going to raise your hand if you desire a Bible. We're going to hand it out to you, and you can keep it. It's yours to keep. We're going to be in John 15, reading through Jesus' words. And friends, this is the lifeblood in a lot of ways of whether we're going to experience the born-again life or not, church. This morning, I was flustered as all get out. I confess that. I had kids that were arguing. I was in an argument earlier with my bride this week. I'm asking if she's okay. I think one of our kids got sick last night. We were up late and so flustered and flustered, overwhelmed and anxious I ended up growing. And it was in that moment, by the grace of God, he reminded me of John 15, Jesus' words to his disciples. Remain in me and I will remain in you apart from me, meaning Jesus, you can do nothing. Remain in Christ. And so by God's grace, I said, God, I'm going to stay connected to you. I am going to consciously remind myself that everything around me and how I respond to it is going to be influenced by my connectedness to him. Are you with me, church? Because the vertical definitely influences all the horizontal. Let's pray and we'll get into John 15. Jesus, do your work through your spirit, your church, City Light Bennington, would it be a place where the born again experience deeper and intimate relationships with one another and with your spirit? Would you mature and shape and would you produce fruit that lasts for generations to come? That only comes, God, by us staying connected to you. So we need you, I need you, Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of the living God, baptize me, immerse me in your anointing, God, to teach and to herald and to communicate your truth. And I'm asking that you would soften the hearts of those who are not born again here and those who are God, that we would receive the blessing that you desire for us to receive from your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, y'all, Jesus' words, he's talking to his disciples. And it's less than 24 hours before his death. So as he's walking alongside the, the countryside, he sees a vineyard or he's looking at a temple that shows a grapevine. And he says these words to his disciples. I am the true grapevine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. He prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more fruit. Look up here at this slide. In a vineyard, in a grape vineyard, you end up having a vine, and on it are branches, and from those branches, you end up seeing grape clusters. And so if you'll look up here, if we have the image, the vine is Jesus. The branches are us, and God the Father is the gardener. He's the one who holds the pruning scissors. And the vine, essential for us to be reminded, the vine carries all the nutrients to the branch. The vine is the reason why there are grape clusters being produced on the branches. And in an even greater way, Jesus is the, say it with me, the, the reason you and I will ever produce fruit. He is the sole reason. He's the true vine. And the fruit that Jesus is talking about here are in one way the fruit of God's Holy Spirit. 
When you end up surrendering your life, your will, running your life, you turn from sin and you put your trust in Christ, you end up experiencing the fruit of God. Love. That's sacrificially willing the good of another. You end up producing uh, peace. That is a rest in anxious times. Joy. That's extreme happiness and pleasure. Faithfulness actually producing a person, a character, and integrity that God gives you where you are trustworthy. Patience, going at another's pace. Goodness will be produced in you when you're connected to Jesus. And that's goodwill towards others. You end up having self-control produced in you. And that by all means, whether you, especially you will notice it when you get born again, you will be able to, by God's grace, control the lustful desires that were once true of you. And if that isn't enough, friends, staying connected to that vine as branches ends up producing even more fruit. It gives us the ability and the desire to fulfill the one another's in the new covenant scriptures. There are over 59 of them. Love one another. Bear with one another. Be merciful with one another. Forgive one another. Share the good news of Jesus to one another. The list goes on and on. Are you with me? Do you get the fruit that he's talking about? You got it, church? All right, that sounds good. I want to see if you're catching up with me. And my question is, and it may be too rhetorical, who wants more fruit? Okay, I got some sobering news. Ben, I love it. Talk to me. It's going to hurt to produce more fruit. Because Jesus is going to promise something about God the Father as a gardener. Look with me in the text. He, Jesus is still speaking, the Father cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. And God the Father prunes. He prunes the branches that do bear fruit. So that they will what? Produce, say it with me, even more. In a vineyard, there are many ways that a branch can stop producing fruit. One of them is mold. In a spiritual sense, there are many ways that we can stop producing the fruit that we just talked about. One of them is pride. And in order to produce more fruit, which is the goal of God the Father's pruning, God will have to cut off and trim us from some of the hindrances and strongholds that we've experienced. In a greater way, the Father prunes us so that we will produce more spiritual fruit. The Father's pruning comes in three yeses. You're welcome for the alliteration. Didn't come from me. Suffering, scripture, and spiritual siblings. The pruning, meaning the cutting, so that you will grow even more spiritual fruit because of the Father's good desire for you to experience more love, joy, peace, patience. Fill in the blank. It all ends up coming down, in a sense, to when we're in moments where we're hearing the word of God being preached or we're reading the word of God and there's that ouch moment because the Holy Spirit is applying his word to your heart and he's cutting it up and pruning it and making you aware of your sin and your offense towards God. The other ouch moments that we end up seeing are with spiritual siblings. That's how father, the father ends up pruning a lot of us. It's when we're in our huddles and in our city groups and a brother or sister in Christ end up calling us to repentance. Those are some of the ouch moments that God uses to prune us. But really good news, friends. Who he is pruning are those who are already producing fruit. Those who are already producing fruit. Just this past week, Danny and I had our once a month um, counseling session. It's a proactive thing that we started to get counseling uh, a year and a half ago when we started this church plant. And they end up handling the 2% of our marriage. We call it the 2% because when you meet that often with people and when you gain skills to actually die to one another and our preferences, then we can handle those that much more quickly. So they handle the 2% that seems unresolved conflict in our marriage. And I'm thinking going into this on Tuesday night, I'm good. Like the conflict, <laughs> yeah, yep, you guys, you know what I'm talking about. I'm thinking we're good. We can talk about something else, maybe how the Lord's blessed our marriage, fill in the blank. And Danny ends up bringing something that I thought we had already squashed. Actually, if I'm being honest, I thought that wasn't a big deal. You see, last weekend I ended up 
giving her my word and I said, I will be back at this time. And I'm, I'm guilty of always offering it. She never asked for it. That's my issue because I want her to feel cherished. I'm going to meet that time I get back from the gym. I end up being 15 minutes late, which causes her to end up being late for her class. I know it's a silly thing to some of y'all, but what she felt was being unheard, unseen, and uncherished. And as I am listening to this, I am thinking to myself, are you serious? Are you for real? Do you not know how much I do for you and our family? The enemy was whispering lies in my mind. Actually, even before that, what I was recalling because of my selfishness was I've been killing it with taking care of our kids. I've grown in discipling them. I pray with them. When they go to sleep, I pray over them. I, I'm doing the extra. I'm taking the kids off of her lap on the weekend. I'm trying to give her rest. Do you not know that we have a regular date night? I'm going through all these things. We're even reading a book together. Yes, <laughs> fellas, we're reading a book together. I'm going through all of the good works, and the enemy ends up telling me she is ungrateful. Your bride does not appreciate you, but that was the farthest thing from the truth. Because the reality was, she does. I wasn't seeing the best in her. The issue was with me. The issue was with my heart. I was justifying my sin of being dishonest towards her. I was justifying it because I had done so many other good works. And that's not the kingdom of God. I was justifying my sin and saying, Danny, give me grace because I'm doing so much more better good works, although I've made a mistake. That's not the kingdom of God, friends. That's playing religious games. That, in other words, is keeping score. And here's where you end up when you end up wanting mercy for your mistakes because you're doing that much more better in other areas. When you're killing it, like I thought I was, I end up going into self-righteousness. But when I'm not and I'm confronted with the same truth that I've offended her, I, I go into despair. Either ones you do not want to end up being at, whether it's self-righteousness or despair. But catch this, friends. The reason I'm sharing this is because the conflict that I shared with you was God the Father's way of growing me. It's true. I'm doing those things that I said in terms of leading my family but God is snipping the small buds so that I produce even more and more fruit. That I have a bride who doesn't have to be tempted by the thought that, sh that I actually care for her and consider her in decision making. Are you with me? God the Father works just like that. His best interest is for you, born again saint. And he will take that 2% that seems like it's unfair and he will snip it and he will snip it through the scriptures, through spiritual siblings, through any which way so that you will produce more fruit. Somebody gave me an amen. Praise God. The pruning, the pruning is the difference between okay versus great relationships. It's the difference between growing versus being stunted. It's the difference between breakthrough and being blocked. It's the difference, friends, between fruit and more fruit. And you confessed earlier, you want more fruit. It's going to hurt. But your father has a greater vision for your life than I could ever cast for you or you could even cast for yourself. He wants to conform you into his image in every single area. Friends, if you're being pruned, no need to sulk about it as I did. It's normal. It's a way that God cares for you, and he wants to bear more fruit if you would not give up in your well-doing. That is a promise. Yes, the cuts are going to hurt, but we always have to remember that the fruit that is born from it is everything that is commendable and what we desire, as we talked about earlier. So the question is, how do we actually produce more fruit? How do we actually see that fruit being produced in us? Jesus then goes into it in verse 4. Follow with me. Jesus speaking, remain in me, meaning the vine, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. 
if you cannot be fruitful unless, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. We have a promise, friends, that if we remain connected to Jesus, he will remain connected to us. In other words, remaining means staying connected. If you want to bear fruit, stay connected to Jesus and he will stay connected to you. And the Holy Spirit of God will produce fruit in your life. Then we end up seeing a caution here in this same text that we can't end up producing fruit if we are not staying connected to him. In other words, our fruit is conditional. Our fruit is dependent on us being obedient. Our fruit means that we have to stay connected. Verses 7 and 10 end up showing us what that actually looks like, and that's by listening to and obeying the word of God. Look with me up on the board here. James Boyce, a theologian, ends up giving us a little bit of, a, of, of an expression of what staying connected looks like. We must decide to do things which expose ourselves to him. And we must keep ourselves in contact with him. God's holy scriptures have, has given a prescription to us. They are the means of grace to stay connected with God. And that comes through praying. That comes through fasting. That comes through scripture, reading, scripture memorization, scripture meditation, scripture studying. All of these spiritual exercises are prescribed by God for us to stay connected to him so that we would bear more fruit. The misconception that, that we can easily fall into is, okay, I was walking one way as not being born again. I planted my foot and I'm now following Jesus. And then you end up being like, okay, I'm just kind of floating. And you think that you're gonna just flow into holiness. But we all know that the enemy, the world, our old sin nature ends up tempting us to look back at the way we lived and be convinced that that truly is the better way to live. In other words, there's an old hymn that says, our hearts are prone to wander. Our hearts are prone to wander. And it makes sense that we would think, okay, we don't have to put effort into growing in godliness because if we're all honest in how the scripture, scriptures testify, we didn't work ourselves into the kingdom of God. We, it wasn't by our works that we were saved. There was nothing that was admirable about us in our sin condition. You following with me, church? So then when we end up getting born again, we think, okay, we carry on in that disposition. Don't work. <laughs> Don't put in effort. But the scriptures testify differently. They say that God gives his Holy Spirit to the regenerate person. And you end up getting a hunger to spend time with him. In other words, to go through spiritual exercises. And as you do, friends, discipleship is so easy. As you spend time with God the Father, he will make you look more like him. Read with me. Philippians 4, verse 7. Do not waste time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. Instead, train yourself to be godly. The original word is gymnazo, and it means to exercise. It is the English word, it's, it's, it's the Greek word where we end up getting our English word gymnasium and in gymnastics. So in other words, if you want to see spiritual fruit, it takes effort, it takes sweat, it takes sacrifice. It's the 6 a.m. wake up to connect with God in silence and solitude. It's praying throughout the day. There are no shortcuts to holiness. There's no shortcuts to end up fixing whatever is wrong with you between you and other people. It comes directly by connecting vertically first. City light, if you aren't seeing any fruit in your life, could it be that we are not exercising? That we are not, I'll put it in another way. Because when I say spiritual exercises, you're going to think, okay, we're getting lost in it. That we're not seeking God. 
That we're not seeking him by praying, by fasting, by just opening the word and allowing it to read our hearts and to expose our sin. Just like muscles need to grow by exercise, we spiritual siblings need to grow by spiritual exercise. My coach used to end up saying this, first you form the habit, then the habit forms you. First you form the habit, then the habit forms you. I am a product of spiritual exercises. The things you've heard me share in the last year and a half of my quiet times are spiritual exercises. I have repented and continually experienced the grace of God that I can so easily forget that once won me over 13 years ago to be born again, I can forget that unless I step into spiritual exercises. You don't just drift into holiness. You don't just drift into godliness. You, just like in your relationships and if you're married, you don't just drift into a great marriage. It takes work. Let's not fall into the trap that our godliness does not take effort. Now I'm going to go through some real practicalities now. Are you with me? This is going to be four wise things to consider. Spiritual exercises are just hard to start. They are hard to start just like going to the gym. So my exhortation is, if you can, do them together. Do them in your huddles. Do them in your city group to end up encouraging one another. A CrossFit is a thing, okay? Some of us love it. Some of us don't like it. I'm not going to go there. But do you know why that CrossFit community is so together? Is because they work out together. And I want to encourage you, as you continue to grow and persevere and spending time with God, doing it together is just wise. Now, I'm giving this wisdom because we're practicing it right now in our huddle. And we're going through silence and solitude. And it is going to take perseverance to continue to remind us that it is worth it. Because just like going to the gym takes a while for you to see results... It takes a while for you to see godliness as you exercise spiritually. So many parallels. Some spiritual exercises you're going to end up seeing are not fruitful. It's just the way it is. Season of life, fill in the blank. And it is perfectly fine because just like when you go to the gym and you end up skipping out on certain machines because they're garbage for you. I won't say garbage for spiritual exercises. I take that back. They won't be as profitable for you in season. Don't feel guilty that you rotate the ones that you do not like, but expose yourself, be in contact with God through trying them. That's the reason why our huddle is actually going through them right now. And lastly, you can listen back on this, Spotify, YouTube, webpage, iTunes. I don't have an image here. Spiritual Disciplines, I'm gonna give you four resources. Spiritual Disciplines by Donald Whitney. If you want something thorough, it's fascinating. The Good and Beautiful Life or The Good and Beautiful God by James Bryan Smith is what I was raised on when I first got born again. And then lastly, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality by Pete Scazzaro is what our staff goes through. It's our language and it is massively producing fruit within this church. The spiritual exercises. They get a bad rap. Let's just be honest. (laughs) You can go to church and there's, there's this false dichotomy that someone could end up bringing while they're preaching the word, like quiet times versus grace of God and earning. No, 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 no. Here's the reality. We can make idols and make anything sinful, right? So for instance, I can make my family, my work, sports an idol, but that doesn't mean you neglect them. So if we're thinking, well, I came from a Roman Catholic background and I saw how many people were self-righteous and how many people didn't have a heart for God because they went through the spiritual exercises, I want you to, I want you to know that can't happen. And for those of us who end up being like, I just, I just, you know, I'm going through a season. Whenever I do spiritual exercises, I feel like I'm not connecting with God. It just feels like a labor and like a work. That can happen. But my exhortation is to continue to be obedient and seek God. James said, draw near to God and God will draw near to you.
God will draw near to us. For without these spiritual exercises, and again, when I say spiritual exercises, get to the heart of it, without pursuing God on a personal or corporate level, I don't think we're going to end up seeing true revival in our household. I don't think we're going to see true revival in our area. And I don't think there'll be a reawakening in any of those places. That's not an original thought. Look with me. English author, mid-1900s, Martin Lloyd-Jones ends up saying this. How often do we hear about the discipline of the Christian life these days? How often do we talk about it? How often is it really to be found at the heart of our evangelical living? There was a time, the Christian church, when there was a time that it was at the very center, and it is, I profoundly believe, because of the neglect of this discipline that the church is in her present position. Indeed, I see no hope whatsoever of any true revival and reawakening until we return to it. Church, we have experienced Zechariah 4.10 blessing the first year and a half. Do not despise small beginnings, for the Lord delights in the work beginning. Just by starting a church, the anointing of God's spirit has been on this congregation. We have seen baptisms. We have seen people truly get born again and saved. There is discipleship happening. There is service happening. There is growth happening and maturity happening in the body of Christ. But as 2022 begins here in January and we enter into year two, I agree with Mr. Jones. I don't see the continual reawakening anointing on this church for the born-again saint to go that much more deeper into his identity in Christ. I don't see the revival of the unregenerate heart in our area or in our households unless we return pursuing holiness. And that comes through the spiritual exercises. Look with me up here on the screen. Before this church was actually started, it was a spiritually dry desert. There we go. There were some bushes. Maybe there's some fruit being born. I don't know. But for the most part, this is what we saw. And this is what, by God's grace, he gave us a vision to change just by starting a church. And since the church has started for the past year and a half, you'll see this next image. The kingdom of God, of God has planted vineyards. And there is fruit being born. But if you end up, this is a definitely di- a different scene, right? You tracking with me? Definitely a different scene than when we first started. But if you see to the left, there's still some dry areas. Now look with me of what could happen if we were to pursue holiness in our households and corporately. You'll see this third image. All vineyards, all flourishing, all producing fruit. If you want to see soul transformation in you and become more Christ-like in your life, it's spiritual exercises. If you want to bear fruit that your children and your grandchildren can end up eating and tasting of, that they would end up seeing that Jesus is good and he is real. It will come through spiritual exercises. If we want to continue to see revival and reawakening, it will be through spiritual exercises. It will be our pursuit of God. We can't earn anything as a church. Don't hear that with me. But we see the conditional promises of blessing and we say, God, we want a greater vision for our households in this church. Amen. And it's not just that. It's not just this church end up bearing more fruit, more vineyards, fill in the blank. It's going to be because more people also are being born again. Jesus I'm finishing here, is going to end up giving a hard caution to those of us who are deceived, think that we truly have repented and believe, and yet have not. Verse 2 and 6, so you're going to have to skip with me. He, meaning the Father, cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. 
such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. The branches that are truly not connected to Jesus, the people who are truly not connected to Jesus are on the ground and withering. And it doesn't specify unknowingly so or knowingly so. But you will wither and the text ends up making a promise that God the Father will end up grabbing and gathering all of those and throwing it into the fire to be burned. If you haven't truly been born again, if you haven't truly repented and believed, it is a dim future. And that's one of eternal punishment and hell. It's a sobering thought. It's a sobering thought to think that so many of us in this world and even in this church, if we're being very honest, could be deceived in that way. I want, I want to give a couple scriptural references because I want to be helpful for everyone to evaluate if you genuinely have experienced this. The first is when someone gets born again, you have a desire to know the word of God. And I'm talking about you want to know the word of God. If the relationship was between you and your Bible where you're standoffish before, but then you end up wanting to date your Bible, that's what it feels like. You just have new feelings towards the word of God. That is true when the Holy Spirit indwells the believer. Then there's the desire to obey Jesus. You just want, it's like, it's like, it's like as kids, no one really wants to obey our parents, I should say for us rebellious kids. But there comes a, a time and place where your heart changes and you see the value and, and you want to. You have that want to obey Christ more than not. Then you end up seeing the distress over sin. You just can't do the things. You just don't want to. You don't have the hunger to do the things that used to separate you from God. And then there's the concern for the lost. Do you have a true concern for the people who are close to you, the people who are far off from you, your neighbors, your family members, your children, to know Christ, not just so they escaped hell, but so that Jesus gets more worship. Are those things stirring in your heart? Have they ever stirred in your heart? I'm gonna give a little bit more discerning things. Does the thought of Jesus not running your life bring you sorrow? When you sin, do you have a godly sorrow not just, I want to take care of this so we can move on type of thing between you and other people. When you, when, would your closest friends end up saying to you, if you were to ask them, I see a continual life of repentance. A continual, yes, I'm sinning, but God, I'm turning back. I've fallen into my old sin nature. God, I'm turning back and following you. Because at the end of the day, the best indicator are from the people who are closest to you that you truly have a repentant life that's motivated by a godly sorrow. So look with me in verse six to end up seeing just how, how much we have to consider the branches who are not connected to the vine and their eternal fate. Anyone, Jesus speaking here, who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. Hell is no funny word to just throw around. The severity of it is that when people, when branches end up going in and transitioning to the next life after their last dying breath, the scriptures testify it is unending eternal torment that you cannot imagine. And friends, my goal is not for everyone here to be like, oh my goodness, I've Am I really born again? Like, I don't want to put fear into you from the enemy. But what I want us to do is just consider and evaluate, where are we with God? Have, are we truly connected to him? Are we truly bearing fruit? Because whether we are or not has eternal ramifications. Look with me in John 10, verse 27 through 30. I want to give us assurance we are a church that looks through the scriptures and see that if someone is born again and has truly repented and believed, your eternal security is secured. That your eternal destination is in heaven and that you being born again means that you are born again and that God's promises that he will see that the work is finished are true for your life. So just to bring us to assurance, 
John 10 ends up saying, Jesus speaking here, no one can snatch them away from me, meaning those who are truly born again. For my Father has given me to them, and he is more powerful than anyone. Again, no one can snatch them, meaning the Christian, from Jesus' hand. From the Father's hand, the Father and Jesus are one. So I don't want you to have to, if you've truly been born again and the Holy Spirit testifies, you're, you're, God just wants you to bear more fruit. He's not asking you to end up going to him and get resaved and resaved again. The goal in this text is to give caution, that Jesus gives caution to. So Matthew 7 verse 21 ends up saying, Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and perform uh, many miracles in your name. But Jesus will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's law. That should shoot fear up into our spines. That the way is brought to destruction. And few will find the narrow path of Jesus Christ. There will be many who are deceived after they transition into the next life. And the fearful thing is that some of us in this room will end up hearing because we we didn't actually have the honesty, because we didn't actually tear down the the wall of pride, because we have all this Christian baggage behind us, because everyone sees us as born again, and we don't actually evaluate if we truly are. Do you know what's more worse than that? Is on judgment day when God looks at our faces and he ends up saying, get away from me. Come on. Right now, you know what Jesus says? He says, come to me. Mm Mm-hmm. Come to me as you are living right now. Jesus is saying, come to me. All those who are weary and heavy burden, and Jesus will give you rest. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. Hallelujah. Open arm invitation to anyone with humility who would come to Christ. But God is not to be mocked. On that last day, he will flip the script and he will say, get away from me. I never knew you. My concern is that there are people in the church, not just here, but everywhere else, we've grown up in Christians' households, so we think we're Christian. We have Christian parents, so we think we're born again. We have a good ethic, but we truly haven't repented and believed. Some of us are married to born-again spouses, and we think we'll just drift into Christianity, and you just ride that coattail, but you really aren't born again. There is a blessing in being around Christian people. And then there is the fleshly side of deceiving yourself. And the enemy would love to do that. My plea this morning as I bring up the band is that you would genuinely consider and ask the Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of truth, if you have truly repented, if you've truly experienced you at some point consciously saying, there's a way that seems right to a man, it leads to destruction, it's all about me. You've truly turned and you said, Jesus, you run my life, you bow that knee and you continue following. If you ask the Holy Spirit, he will give you the answer. Everyone, would you, would you mind standing up with me? We're going to have a few pastors in the back. Friends, if you've come to a place where you genuinely want to walk through some of that process, we're back there with you. If you want to produce more fruit and just need a spiritual brother or sister to pray over you, we're back there. Let's pray. Jesus, produce more fruit in our lives for your glory. Verses 7 through 9 talk about it will bring glory. It'll make your name beautiful to everyone who are around us. Would you get that much more credit in this church? Would we see revival in our area, in our households, and a reawakening to your goodness as we would press into spiritual exercises? You promised to build your church. You promised to grow your church. God, we surrender. 
Amen.